Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Decipher Pharmaceuticals. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, welcome to this educational activity. My name is Dr. Michael Heinrich. I am a professor of medicine at the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute located at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to this program entitled, Changing Paradigms in the Management of Advanced GIST, Implications and Application of New Strategies. Joining me today in this interactive discussion are Dr. Ping Chi, who is the Jeffrey Bean Jr. Faculty Chair and a medical oncologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, and Dr. Patrick Shofsky, head of the Department of General Medical Oncology at the University Hospitals Leuven in Belgium. Welcome to you both. Hello, Mike. Hi, thank you. Today we will discuss the key milestones in management of locally advanced unresectable or metastatic GIST and the new treatment algorithm, particularly what has changed with the new approvals. We will use patient cases to illustrate how to effectively treat patients and what characteristics are used to determine the optimal treatment. In particular, we have focused on the consideration of molecular-driven, tailored personal therapies. We will discuss the treatment options along the disease continuation of care from frontline metastatic disease to treatment of patients in the fourth line. We also, throughout this discussion, uh, highlight some of the unmet needs and the current challenges. So currently in the United States, there are six FDA approved agents that can be used for treatment of GIST. These include imatinib, sunitinib, regorafenib, and the most recently approved repretinib. All of these agents are approved for treatment of GIST, um, but not with, not with any particular specification of the types of GIST that could be treated. We now know that some of these drugs lack activity against certain subtypes of GIST. In contrast to these four agents, there are two agents which are FDA approved, which have specific indications based on a molecular subtype of GIST. These include avapritinib, which was approved earlier this year for treatment of PDGFRA exon 18 mutant GIST, and larotrectinib, which is approved for treatment of any pediatric or adult uh, tumors with an end tract translocation, including the minority of GIST that have such a translocation. Patrick, can you update us on the current status in the EMA for these agents? Well, the status of the agents that you mentioned, Mike, is very similar in Europe. We, of course, have routine access to imatinib, sunitinib, and regorafenib. In some European countries, the other mentioned agents are available through compassionate use or off-label programs and some of the uh, files are in advanced stage of regulatory approval. Okay, and that would match up the United States and Europe quite nicely. So the first uh, case we'd like to consider uh, represents a continuum of care. So our, our case journey begins uh, with a 60-year-old woman who uh, presents with iron deficiency anemia, which is one of the more common presentations for patients with GIST. Imaging uh, to define the uh, cause of her iron deficiency anemia showed a large small bowel tumor with multiple liver metastases. A liver biopsy was performed, uh, which revealed the presence of metastatic GIST. So Patrick, now that we have a diagnosis of metastatic GIST, what additional workup would be desirable? I think apart from conventional staging with uh, imaging, with a CT of the abdomen as a minimum requirement, I think it's very important that we have mutational data, that we perform biopsies and analyze which mutation actually drives this GIST tumor, because we know that the drugs that we have available are not active in all mutational subtypes. So it's very important 
to have at least information on the KIT and PDGF receptor alpha mutational status. I would completely agree with that. Um, my real estate friends like to say it's all about location, location, location. I tell my just patients it's all about mutation, mutation, mutation. So in this case, the molecular uh, workup showed a KIT exon 11 mutant GIST. Ping, having this information, what would you now uh, consider for initial therapy choices? Sure. So the, the standard of care first-line therapy is really imagined 400 milligrams daily. This is based on the parallel phase three clinical trials in North America and Europe and Australia comparing two doses of 400 milligram and 800 milligram of imagined in patients with uh, advanced GIST. The resist response rates are about uh, 45 to 57 percent and the progression-free survival are between 20 months to 24 months with the two doses. There is no statistical significant differences. And the overall survival in both doses is about 46.8 months, so very similar. Um, thus, in this setting, I think we'll, we would use 400 milligrams once daily. Now, if this patient were to have exon 9 mutant GIST, we would consider starting imagine at 400 milligrams once daily and um, titrate up to 800 milligrams once daily as the patient tolerates. Since the um, parallel of the three clinical trials comparing two different doses of imatinib um, demonstrated in, in significantly higher response rate and also longer progression-free survival with the 800 milligram of imatinib comparing to 400 milligram of imatinib. Um, alternatively, one can also consider clinical trials um, considering that only 50% of patients progress uh, would, um, uh, considering that about 50% of the patients would progress within two years and more than 90% of patients would progress, I imagine, within 10 years. Um, clinical trial, uh, if available in first-line settings, should be considered um, with really the goal to improve the efficacy and um, to uh, forestall imagine the resistance. For example, we have recently presented our single arm phase two uh, trial of the combination of imaginative with being imaginative at ASCO 2020 um, based on um, compelling preclinical data demonstrating synergy between the two drugs um, in preclinical models. The combination trial um, demonstrated a resist response rate of 67% and a progression free survival of 30 months in the frontline setting. While this is promising, I would only consider this option in a clinical trial setting for now, pending further uh, randomized trial confirmation. Um, now, considering, um, in addition to the um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment, we should also consider supportive care since the patient, dependent on the severity of uh, the ion deficiency, um, we could potentially consider intravenous ion to help boost the, the ion source to facilitate the recovery of anemia. Um, in general, imagine a 400 milligram once daily dosing is well tolerated. And now I would typically scan the patient um, initially every eight weeks to confirm efficacy, and then we can stretch it out to longer every three to four months. Um, when in doubt, I would also use a PET to help adjudicate responses in progression. Thank you. So the patient was in fact treated with a matinib, which was well tolerated, and the patient fortunately had an objective response per resist. So at this point, um, Patrick, would you consider surgery in a responding patient, or under what circumstances would you think about that? I think at this point in time, this is still a very controversial issue. There are many experienced colleagues treating many GIST patients who consider surgery in responding patients, especially if the number of lesions is somewhat limited and you have a good probability that you can get rid of uh, the majority of the malignant cells and malignant deposits. Uh, other colleagues continue TKI treatment until the patient stops responding to the treatment. And then the question remains, does the patient have focal progression or multifocal progression I think the strongest evidence for surgery we have in patients with focal progression on treatment with a TKI, where we have some data showing that removal of the focal progression of the lesion that seems not to be responding anymore can be a reasonable approach. 
What is important is that you have to continue TKI treatment after that, whatever kind of surgery you do. Yes, it's fortunate that randomized studies of the role of surgery combined with TKI therapy have just not been successful in either being launched or being successful mm -hmm. in accrual. So after two years of imaginative treatment, the CT scan showed clinically relevant progression. So back to you, Patrick, what would be the potential causes of this imatinib resistance? Well, of course, we know multiple causes for imatinib resistance. What you are describing here in this case is a very typical finding. So after a period of two, two and a half years, patients start developing uh, resistant lesions, which uh, are progressing on images, on CT scans or on PET scans showing increased metabolic activity. We know that there are only a few cases of GIST which show primary resistance mutation. That is very uncommon. What is much more common is secondary resistance occurring on treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, most likely due to the selective pressure on the tumor cells with uh, effective inhibition of specific clones of the tumor. Um, resistance mutations are a very common phenomenon in GIST. And there are actually genetic changes that are occurring in exons encoding tyrosine kinase domains, reactivating the KIT or the PDGF receptor alpha receptor. These changes typically occur in exons encoding for the ATP binding site or the activation loop of the gene, of the receptor. Now that we have this uh, progression and presumed uh, resistance uh, due to secondary mutations, what would be treatment strategies that we would consider, Ping, for this patient? So, so the treatment strategies are really um, threefold. But before that, I think uh, while it's still investigational, but uh, Patrick mentioned figuring out um, what type of resistance mechanisms are involved, especially what type of secondary resistance mutations um, are involved uh, in uh, to imagine it. Um, therapy are involved in this setting would be um, potentially significant, especially um, as we have more and more um, um, mutation uh, specific uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors for treatment. But for now, um, I would uh, consider this a first uh, surgery, as Patrick mentioned earlier. Um, if there is a limited disease progression, refractory to imagine, for example, a solitary uh, resistant lesion or oligoclonal um, um, progression, um, surgery can be utilized to really prolong the effect of imaginib. And this is um, more, um, as Mike mentioned, there isn't randomized trial um, to, um, to support this at this point, but I think uh, in general, from a philosophical standpoint and also common practice, um, prolonging the utility of imaginative C. Now, um, the standard of care second line therapy um, include one um, dose escalation of imaginative from 400 to 600 or uh, 800 milligrams daily dosing. Um, this is based on, um, again, the long term follow up study comparing the two doses of imaginative, uh, which had demonstrated a clinical benefit. Um, of um, and prolonging medium um, progression free survival by about 11 to 12 weeks. Um, the second option would be um, to use second line um, FDA approved therapy, sunitinib. Um, sunitinib is a multi targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor that inhibits KID, PDGF alpha, and VEGF receptors. And the F um, and there was a clinical, a phase three randomized clinical trial comparing sunitinib at uh, 50 milligrams per week on two weeks off schedule versus placebo, uh, where it demonstrated significant improvement of the medium progression free survival compared to uh, placebo. And uh, the objective response rate was uh, only 7% though. Um, the dose um, tested in the clinical trial was um, 50 milligrams once daily, uh, four weeks on and two weeks off. At that dose, uh, many patients um, suffered hand foot syndrome, hypertension, and later on there is a phase two clinical trial comparing um, the 50 milligram once daily dosing for weeks on two weeks off with a continuous dosing um, of sunitinib at 37.5 milligram once daily and demonstrated um, better tolerability and, um, and also 
uh, equivalent uh, efficacy. So um, currently in the GIST community, um, the 37.5 milligram once daily dosing uh, is frequently practiced. Uh, I agree, but I think Patrick, you might prefer the uh, original schedule. I tend to follow the original label and dosing schedule for sunitinib and start with 50 milligram and give the drug four week on, two week off. But also in my practice, I of course learned that not many patients tolerate the original schedule. So there is a lot of variation to the theme. You see um, that patients switch early to continuous dosing at lower doses, longer intervals, longer treatment breaks. Uh, I've seen a lot of variation and uh, I think our task is to find a dose and schedule that is suitable for the individual patient. I just wanted to mention what's worth mentioning is in this in the second line setting, there is also one should also consider clinical trials if available, um, and then we'll, which we will go into a little bit more detail. Currently, there is the intrigue clinical trial comparing uh, a new drug uh, with Pretinib um, versus Sunitinib with the traditional dosing schedule uh, with a one to one randomization. So to continue the case, the patient, um, as predicted by uh, Ping, uh, did have mild, moderate hand, foot, skin reaction and some diarrhea, but uh, this was uh, medically optimized with supportive care. Um, despite compliance, um, after five months of therapy, uh, unfortunately, progression was noted on a follow-up scan. So at this point, we have a patient with both a matinib and sunitinib-resistant gist. Patrick, what treatment strategies would you consider at this point? Well, first of all, I would like to mention that this is a very typical evolution of uh, such a GIST patient with an exon 11 mutation with a relatively long duration of disease control with first line imatinib and the unsatisfactory duration of disease control with the second line sunitinib that is poorly tolerated in many patients. So this is really very typical and also in line with my own personal experience. Well, uh, after failure of uh, second line treatment with sunitinib, we would of course consider treatment with regorafenib, which is the approved standard of care in that setting. Do you, regorafenib, there's kind of been quite a bit of controversy about dosing strategies to ensure uh, optimal tolerance. Do you have a preferred way of uh, starting the drug? I again tend to follow the official label and the official dosing instructions, but my experience also tells me that again, many, many patients who start with full dose require early dose modifications. I think that's more common practice than the exception to the rule. Ping, do you, what's your strategy for starting regorafenib? So initially, I think uh, 160 milligrams, uh, three weeks on, one week off. But then um, as um, the trial, many, many patients actually required a dose reduction. And there had been a recent study um, in the colon cancer group where regorafenib is um, also FDA approved comparing two dosing strategy. And, and um, in that study, they demonstrated that starting at a dose of uh, regorafenib at 80 milligrams once daily and with weekly escalation by 40 milligrams uh, increment to 160 milligrams per day, three weeks on one week off, really help the patients to tolerate at least two cycles and uh, uh, significantly more patients made it to the first cycle. And of course, in that um, study, they have also used um, additional supportive care like using topical steroids, clobetazole to help uh, with the hand and foot syndrome. So this is actually uh, the current strategy that we're using now uh, amongst the most of my uh, practice and my colleagues' practice. If I may add here, I think it would be a fair statement to say that uh, every patient receiving standard second and third line uh, requires dose modifications or schedule modifications, or at least the vast majority. I agree. I think in my practice, at least two thirds of them would require dose reduction. I think a, another takeaway point would be that these side effects often occur and can become severe within the first 10 days of treatment in patients who are at too high a dose. And so early intervention, early follow up with your patients is important. You can't start the drug and tell people to come back in four weeks because 
they may not make it even two weeks on the on whatever dose they're prescribed. So supportive care and dose adjustments very important for this drug. So continuing on in the evolution and uh, journey of this case, so the patient did tolerate regorafenib, um, did require a dose reduction to 120 milligrams per day, um, and dose reductions required because of hand foot skin reaction and somewhat lesser for diarrhea. Um, however, after five months of therapy, a progression was noted on the scan. So at this point, um, there's a new agent we'd like to discuss. So Ping, could you start us off by talking about uh, the new agent Repretinib and talk about its novel mechanism of action? Sure, so Repretinib is, um, has just been FDA approved in May of this year. It is a switch control tyrosine kinase inhibitor that binds to the switch pocket and locks the tyrosine uh, kinase um, into its inactive form. So it broadly inhibits both KID and PDGFR alpha signaling through um, um, this dual mechanism of action. And it can potentially inhibit a broad spectrum of um, KID and PDGFR alpha mutations, not only the primary mutations, but also the secondary resistance mutations in exon 13, 14, and 17, and 18. And then uh, following up on that, uh, could you talk about the testing of the agent and in particular the phase three results? Um, sure. So, so, so Repretinib has actually demonstrated pretty promising efficacy uh, in initially in the phase one study with an objective response rate about 9%. And this was um, further confirmed uh, in a phase three randomized uh, placebo-controlled study um, with a cross over of the placebo arm once uh, upon progression. Um, the, the oral repretinib was given 150 milligram once daily, and that's the FDA approved dose. In this study, um, it demonstrated that it's called the Invictus study, and it demonstrated a significant improvement in progression free survival. Um, for the um, repretinib arm, the uh, progression free, the median progression free survival is 6.3 months, and the placebo arm, the median progression free survival is 1.0 months. And uh, repretinib um, also demonstrated uh, that the repretinib arm, even with crossover, also demonstrated a promising overall survival um, benefit, um, and even though this is not their um, primary endpoint. Yes, I found the Invictus results very exciting. Patrick, would you like to comment as well? I agree that the data uh, are very exciting and this is a very important treatment option for our patients with prior exposure to other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. What I think has not been mentioned yet is that the safety profile of the drug differs a little bit from the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we have been using over the past 20 years. There is a higher incidence of alopecia associated with the use of this drug. And I think this is something that we should inform patients about when starting this fourth line treatment. Yes, that certainly is, you know, a, not medically significant, but, you know, personally um, and psychologically significant side effect. I was very impressed with the Invictus results in terms that there was a very low rate of dose reduction from the starting dose of 150 milligrams and there was a very low rate of patients discontinuing uh, due to um, side effects. Um, you know, I think it also was impressive from the standpoint that, you know, I, in my personal opinion, I view the side effects of repretinib as being milder and easier to manage than sunitinib and regorafenib. So um, it, we have a fourth line therapy that yields at least as good or not longer progression-free survival results as the earlier agents and in my opinion, it has less uh, side effects. Um, you know, overall, I think in our discussion of, of, the, of case one so far, we've highlighted that this is a very typical um, patient journey for a patient with KIDX on 11 mutant gist. Some patients would do not as well as this, and some would do better in terms of individual lines of therapy. Um, but overall, we, we see diminishing returns with each of the lines of therapy Although interestingly, repretinib at 
six months of progression-free survival is at least as good as what we saw in, in the second line. So that the intrigue study, which you refer to the phase three study is ongoing. Accrual has been somewhat affected by the global pandemic, um, but we're hopeful that accrual would be completed in 2021 and that we would possibly have the results of that study later in 2021. So something to look forward to because that again would change our paradigm of treatment. I'd like to shift gears now to a second case um, to highlight some different points relative to the management of advanced gist. So this case is a 62-year-old male who presents with abdominal pain. The pa patient underwent uh, upper endoscopy as well as imaging, which revealed a 12-centimeter gastric mass. And unfortunately, at least five liver metastases uh, were detected uh, on imaging. The pathology showed an epithelioid gist. At this point, Patrick, is there additional workup that we would need to consider? I think just in the case, as in the case of uh, patient number one that we discussed earlier, there is clearly a need for a genetic workup of the tumor material from this patient, especially because of the anatomical localization. We know that one in five gastric gists carry a mutation that is highly resistant to standard first-line treatment with imatinib the PDGF receptor alpha mutation D842V. So it's absolutely mandatory to have full genetic information here to exclude the, exclude the possibility that it could be such a case, especially also because of the morphology of the tumor cells, the epitheloid character that you describe in the case. So we want to see here full genetic uh, information on the case to select the right drug for first line treatment. Yes, uh, the epithelioid uh, just is a big tip off that it may not res respond to imatinib, so I absolutely agree. So knowing that it has a PDGFRA D842V mutation, which would be very common in, in a gastric gist, what should we think about therapy-wise here? Um, so traditionally, um, prior to, um, it's well known that PDGFR alpha D842V is completely resistant to imatinib. Um, Cranolalib has been um, um, tested in the clinical setting, but more recently, there's really exciting data from a phase one navigator study um, of avapritinib, a new um, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's specifically designed to target KID and PDGFR alpha, especially the exon 17 18 mutation, as well as the PDGFR alpha D842V. Um, in this phase one study, it demonstrated significant overall response rate of um, 86% and with 95% uh, of patients with tumor shrinkage. And the medium uh, um, um, progression-free survival has not been reached. And this is really exciting based on this phase one results. Um, Avapertinib has recently been FDA approved for the um, frontline um, use of um, um, patients with uh, PDGFR alpha, D842V, and other exon 18 mutant GIST. Patrick, I know that you've been involved in the early studies of avapritinib. Would you like to additionally comment? Well, the only additional comment I would like to give is if you look at the waterfall plot uh, of shrinkage of pre-identified target lesions uh, of patients with D842V mutation in that trial, the vast majority of patients responded to this treatment with significant volumetric responses, which we have never seen before in the past 20 years of using tyrosine kinase inhibitors in GIST. So this is really exciting data, and it's so important that we now have finally a treatment option for patients with this mutational variant of GIST. Yes, I think it's really exciting. You know, over the last 20 years, as we've had the TKI revolution, it's been frustrating when we see patients with D842V mutant GIST to have to say, although you may have heard that GIST is treatable, unfortunately, the type of GIST you have yeah. is not very treatable. And now we have something that's highly active um, and it's very exciting. In some ways, I think it's very similar to 20 years ago when we first started developing a matinib for kid mutant GIST. Uh, Dr. Chi, would you like to? offer some concluding thoughts about the changing paradigm? Sure, I think we have come a long way of treating 
patients with advanced GIST since the initial FDA approval of Imatinib in 2002, followed by sunitinib, regorafenib, and most recently, ripratinib and avoprigenib. Um, the obvious clinical challenges that we will be facing are how to treat patients who have progressed on um, ripratinib or um, avoprigenib after um, the, their indicated setting and how to leverage molecular data to optimize uh, treatment paradigm. While there had been uh, tremendous progress, um, some fundamental challenges remain, and that is imagine resistance. Um, we know that for the majority of the patients, um, more than 90% of the patients who can benefit from imagine it, but this benefit is not indefinite. And once their disease develops resistance to imagine it, um, their responses to subsequent lines of receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapies, including newer generations of TKIs that we have discussed here, have really limited clinical benefit. So I think the next phase of clinical investigations should focus on um, not only the uh, multiple refractory setting, but also focusing on intervening early and developing therapeutic strategies to transform uh, TKI-mediated cytostatic effect, meaning suppressing cell growth to cytotoxic effect, meaning killing cancer cells. And some of these strategies could involve novel combination therapies or outside of the box, novel therapeutic targets, for example, targeting the tumor microenvironment. And on top of all these, I think there are still significant unmet needs for the subset of patients with KID and PDGF alpha wild type GISTs. These would include the SDH deficient GIST, mainly affecting the pediatric and young adult population, the NF1 mutant GIST that occurs and that occurs in both uh, the sporadic and the syndromic settings associated with the neurofibromatosis one, RAS mutant, et cetera. Um, I think these group of patients shall be considered differently from the kid and pdgf alpha mutant uh, cases. And the therapeutic development should be tailored to their particular genetic defects and potential molecular vulnerabilities. So you've given us a pretty good roadmap for the future. Patrick, do you have any uh, additional comments? I think there's nothing much to add to what Ping just said. My personal experience or my personal impression is that over the past two decades, we have made tremendous progress in a disease that was untreatable until 2000, until the year 2000. And we have transformed this aggressive malignancy by developing and exploring a series of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the clinic into a chronic disease status. And this is really impressive. And what is even more impressive is the fact that we added two additional lines of treatment options for GIST patients only this year. And I, of course, hope that our treatment results will even improve in the near future by further clinical testing and clinical trials and development of new treatment strategies for GIST. This has certainly been a very exciting uh, year for the GIST field, and it's been great for the international collaboration. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chi and Dr. Shofsky for their participation. I'd like to thank the audience uh, for participating in this educational activity. Please continue on and answer the following questions and complete the evaluation. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global.